This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. At the end of the day, the mission is always the same, to become a skillful practitioner of the art of Christian education to reach out and open minds, to inspire, to bring the Christian faith home and nurture it. Nobody else seems to have noticed the bird. Everybody goes by. In 2014, women and men from all cultures and backgrounds gather to learn this craft. They have at their disposal almost miraculous modern technology, the support and resources of one of the great seminaries in America and the lessons learned from thousands and thousands of classes, including that very first class called into session 100 years ago. That first class was a result of a visit to Union Theological Seminary seven years earlier by a young woman named Annie Wilson, who asked to take courses to prepare for the foreign mission field. Dr. Walter Moore, who was president of the seminary at the time, saw this request by Annie and 13 other women as an inspiration. The church needed lay workers, needed educators, needed people with training to serve as missionaries. He knew he had to take action. That action was the beginning of the General Assembly's training school for lay workers, the genesis of the Presbyterian School of Christian Education. Looking back at the history, how one little woman who was going to the foreign mission field said, I teach me how to, I want some training. I want, and Bible, she wanted to learn the Bible. And they said, well, let's see if we can't, see if we can let you in on our classes. Well, they invited her and she sat in on the class and found her a place to live. And, you know, it, she had 14 friends and they came along, you know, with, and that's how it got started. And then you stop and look at what all has come as a result of that. And the faculty taught two professors who were here with preachers in the churches and the women of the church in Richmond who helped to make this thing happen. They didn't take any money. I mean, they taught. They were being, you know, paid other ways, you know, but not to, not to have a, a school of Christian education. And it bloomed. By 1915, ATS had a home, moving from a donated space in downtown Richmond to a sprawling house first rented, then purchased, on the corner of Chamberlain and Westwood Avenues. This became the gathering spot for this nascent institution. Within three years, enrollment grew from 28 to 70 students, and the Assembly's Training School purchased two houses on Seminary Avenue and one on Chamberlain. The school granted a diploma after two years of study. Local pastors, professors from Union Theological Seminary, and others volunteered their time to teach these students. This marked the beginning of a parallel, yet interlaced relationship between the two schools that would live for 81 years across from each other on Brook Road, a wide suburban street with big fields and a growing number of large, spacious homes. The two schools were most certainly connected, yet they had two very distinct missions, and it would stay that way for the better part of eight decades. In that first year, classes were held from noon to 9 p.m. Tuition was $25, and students could board for $4 a week. Books cost $10, and each session lasted nine months. Four years into this experiment in Christian education, Dr. Walter L. Lingle, who held the chair of church history at Union Theological Seminary, became the ATS president in 1918. Students described Dr. Lingle as a father figure with a true personal concern for them. He tended the furnaces on cold mornings and shoveled snow when needed. He was a teacher and a friend with concern for students' comfort and welfare. 
He was also known for his quirky sense of humor, including his thoughts on what makes a great sermon. There are four ups to a sermon. Stand up so you can be seen, speak up so you can be heard, think up so you will be interesting, and shut up so you can be liked. Under Dr. Lingle's leadership, the Assembly Training School grew rapidly. By 1921, the General Assembly authorized the school to pay Stuart Bryant $35,000 for 12 acres of land around the corner of Brook and Westwood. This would be home for decades. Students quickly learned how their future could unfold as they embarked on important missions not far from campus. Richmond, Virginia in 1921 was a manufacturing powerhouse. Tobacco and machining dominated the Richmond economy. That's where ATS students first targeted their efforts, rolling up their sleeves and diving into their work. Which meant that the students went to the factories and the women came on their lunch hour and they were nurtured in the faith by the students who were growing. They might have worship service, they might do worship, they might do Bible study. And these students would even visit the uh, individuals, and most of them in this factory work were African Americans. So there's always been a very openness um, in the culture of PSC. The factories were only part of that mission. These students asserted themselves into the daily fabric of Richmond life and left out no one, even those oppressed by segregation and bigotry. I think it's transformed Richmond because Richmond has had its unique <laughs> struggles historically, the capital of the Confederacy, um, a lot to overcome in terms of race relations throughout its years. And ATS and PSAE helped play a role in that, um, not only in the ways that you've just suggested, work I mean, with uh, people in African-American communities going into mission endeavors in different parts of the city. In the decade that Dr. Lingle served as president, the Assembly's Training School flourished. The energy students displayed in their mission work was equaled by generous donors and the Presbyterian Church leadership. ATS began to look like a true campus, a hub of instruction and a unique community life for students of Christian education in Richmond, Virginia. And then the Depression hit. The economic calamity affected everything in American culture and society, including ATS. Enrollment dropped from 150 students to just 50. Churches, short on finances for their own operation, had to cancel pledges they made to pay for construction of Virginia Hall. This led to a true financial crisis for the school. And yet, ATS and its students persevered. One day, the school got a little star power when Katherine Hepburn's father brought her along to visit his friend, Dean Natalie Lancaster. Missions to factories and the 17th Street Mission, reaching out to minority children, hospitals, jails, and mountain missions continued. While the first male student, George Lucius Newton, sat in that inaugural ATS class, the first significant influx of male students didn't come until the 1940s. Brother Bob White was once a lone figure among many women. And since there were no facilities for men, I took my meals and had my room at the seminary across the street. The boys at UTS were willing to accept me as one of their own. My first years there, we had 69 girls and me. The next year, we had 72 girls and me. After seven years as a DCE, I attended seminary and have served as a minister for 33 years. Thanks be to God. Bob White's pioneering placement was only the beginning of an extraordinary 20 years of growth and expansion. In two decades, ATS transformed from an organization teetering on the brink of existence during the Great Depression to one of the finest and most well-established Christian education schools in the nation, and the only one of its kind in the former Southern Presbyterian Church, the PCUS. The school also became a pioneer in teaching ethics to theological and education students. Dr. Rachel Henderlight led this movement 
unheard of at the time, yet influential on both the ATS and Union Seminary campuses. Dr. Henderlight became active in human relations groups, a precursor of civil rights organizations. She took part in the march from Selma to Montgomery and the March on Washington, where Dr. Martin Luther King gave his transformative I Have a Dream speech. Hundreds of people from dozens of countries, men and women alike, enrolled and then went out into the world to establish high quality Christian education programs at churches across the country and the world. The Assemblies Training School had become a pioneer in the practice of training professional Christian educators. Changing the name of an institution doesn't always reflect change in the institution itself. But in 1959, as the Assemblies Training School became Presbyterian School of Christian Education, or PSCE, the school entered an era of creativity and first-class Christian education, the likes of which had never been seen. Just two years of being enveloped in the high-energy, intense educational experience of PSCE created a lifetime of benefits for students. I knew that I wanted to be a Christian educator, but I wanted to work in the church for a little while before I decided to come to, um, to graduate school. But I knew that I was coming. I just didn't know when. And I was two years in a congregation in North Carolina, and just one day I decided it's time to go. And I packed my bags, resigned from the church, and appeared before I was even accepted as a student. I was in the hall when Dr. McKeever passed me and said, well, by the way, we've met and we've accepted you as a student. And I said, well, I'm glad because I'm here. It was challenging. I'd been out of college 20 years and forgotten how to study. Hadn't done that much research in my, under, in my undergraduate years. So it was a real challenge. I spent in this in the library on campus every Friday night till 11 o'clock. My daughter and I, I brought a 12-year-old daughter. So I found it rigorous, but I also found it a fabulous opp opportunity. A school, no matter how well-funded, is only as good as the teachers who devote their lives to giving students the tools they need to be professionals. Across the board, one teacher truly stood out. Sarah Little was a legend at PSCE and throughout the church. Sarah was uh, an unusually gifted woman in her ability to be both analytical and creative. Um, I've never known anybody who could use both sides of her brain as effectively as she could. To be in the classroom with her and watch her amazing ability to weave the, the basics of the foundation of whatever our subject was into an opportunity for us to interact and learn and, and understand it more fully, uh, she just was unusually gifted that way. And Sarah and Rachel were feminist without even struggling to be. And they went to Yale and got their divinity degrees so that they would, D-men degrees would allow you to preach. And they had no intention of preaching. But that's what they did so that women who followed them, who felt called to preach, would be able to do that. I wanted to learn from Sarah how to teach. I'd been teaching in Africa teaching Bible, fledgling new seminary in the Congo, and realized that I needed to learn more about how to teach. And I didn't, I knew I couldn't find anybody better than Sarah Little to teach me that art. But Sarah went beyond just that local institution teaching. She became a leader in the Association for Theological Seminaries um, and, and, and the head of so many projects and, and enabled people to think broadly about what the church could be and where we should go. She would call us on the carpet if she felt like we were in any way um, downgrading or not, not um, reinforcing the important facets of what we needed to do uh, as effectively as we should. And sometimes was a little curt in doing it. And those of us who knew Sarah and would in occasionally um, uh, have words with her, um, always felt like we lost, <laughs> but always valued so much what she was doing. And she never minimized our dignity 
whenever she would disagree. What Sarah Little and the leadership of PSCE valued most was getting students and faculty to step out of the comfort zone of Christian education. Stepping out of the comfort zone became literal. PSCE hired a high energy young alumnus who knew how to laugh, bring groups together, and who understood the value of recreation. His name was Glenn Bannerman. Unless I were ordained, I could not find work anywhere in the United States in the denomination that we belong to. And so one day Dr. Kramer called me in and said he and Rachel Henderlight, faculty member, Sarah Little and Joe Newberry had been talking and that they would like to experiment with developing a full-time curriculum of recreation and church camping. And would I be interested? And of course, when you don't have any call at all, uh, then that was, you know, grace. So we developed a curriculum of recreation and outdoor education within the, the Christian education curriculum. And we did well. Uh, students responded in courses and we kept developing new courses. And after three years, uh, I kept waiting for somebody to say, we need to renew your contract. And nobody said anything and I didn't know whether to go back in September or not. But we went back and 33 years later we retired. As a student, I did have the chance to see him in action and to enjoy um, the fullness of, of joy that he would bring into a room. As a faculty member, I was fascinated in watching how he would weave that into his uh, academic disciplines. Within the school walls and outside on the lawn, students and faculty alike quickly understood the value of recreational education as designed and implemented by Glenn Bannerman. That's been an interest for me because I'm interested in the camping and recreational ministries and so I've looked for ways to get involved in that type of ministry and the program that PSCE runs here and that's, I think I've really enjoyed that. Community building, relationships, accepting people as they happen to be right where they happen to be. Uh, it also causes you to be interactive with, with each other. In community building, you accept people as they happen to be, and recreation provides for that in many ways. What it had to offer um, set it apart. There were people who would not think it was as academically rigorous as it needed to be. There were other people who thought that the fun and games of recreational ministry like Glenn Bannerman offered or camping and conferencing was superfluous. But we've got many, many studies that have indicated that the foundation of Christian development often has been based on experiences people have had in those arenas. And to have an institution that was willing to risk and focus and provide those opportunities for people uh, was, was extraordinary. Across the brook, however, the value of a rigorous Christian education school itself was not always apparent to the students studying theology at Union Seminary. One guy who was sitting beside me said, you know, we don't think highly of ATS. We think they don't. It was like you weren't capable of the serious in-depth studies that we do. And this guy didn't feel that way, but he was telling me the attitude. And there was an attitude. There has been this misperception that what my field of Christian education is about is either it's about playing with children or it's just about fun time arts and crafts and stuff, which is a really strange misperception and it's a misperception of the PSCE strand of our school too. I mean, I, I come out of that strand and I do th theology. Undeterred by these stereotypes, over the next 30 years, Presbyterian School of Christian Education flourished. Many professors and staff changed the lives of students on campus. Generations of students, men, women, white, black, American, international, all enjoyed learning the Bible, learning how to teach everyone from small children to seniors the details and values inherent in the Bible. They believed that all of God's children were created equally and put that belief into practice.
I like the classes here because they give me more room for self-expression so much and um, all my views are uh, kind of respected in class and I can say what I want and I can be very free with myself. It's very flexible and I don't feel, you know, kind of pressurized by being put into a particular box or a channel. I can be free. I like that a lot. Tell me about the attitude in PSCE about civil rights for uh, minorities and civil rights for women. I think the attitude at the, on the campus, and I'll give uh, our students and faculty credit for this, uh, very accepting. PSCE is the Presbyterian School of Christian Education. By this stage in its development, the leadership and professors at PSCE had created a learning environment that was innovative, intellectual, spiritual, and highly effective. The roots of today's extended campus program designed with the flexibility to allow students a productive home and work life while earning their degree began at PSCE. The thing I appreciated most about PSCE was that the faculty, any course you took, was going to be different every year. It was fresh. It wasn't like in some undergraduate programs where it's a canned kind of presentation and lectures. Every time, every year they taught the same course, it would be different. And I found that to be just a really good reason to be here and knew I was going to be getting the freshest, the most up-to-date, the best possible education. So I learned how to choose a curriculum that was theologically aligned with the congregation. I also had the opportunity to learn different methods of teaching and how do you involve others in teaching. So I think that was really, really good for me coming out. The things I learned in the classroom here, um, I use all, you know, every week with the kids I work with and with the adults I work with. The ability to ask good questions that don't stop learning but enhance learning, I learned here. The ability to face really hard theological questions and not have all the answers and be comfortable with questions, I learned here. Um, to really listen to other people and their ideas, even if they're things I do not agree with initially, I learned here. We have so many graduates of this little school. We never were a big school, but what these graduates of this little school have done all over the world, I just, uh, it makes me want to bust with pride to have had a share in that little school's big impact in the Christian ministry around this globe. While PSCE sent church educators into nearly every corner of the world, Few noticed that the financial status of this extraordinary school was becoming more and more fragile. PSCE or ATS always struggled financially. That was just a hallmark. It was uh, in some ways a stepsister of the denomination in terms of the funding that it received. Ministers who had graduated from seminaries would be in a much better position to leverage funding to come to, the, to their alma maters than Christian educators. Men had a little more influence, well, a whole lot more influence than women. And all of those were issues that that institution had to address. When I became president of PSE in 1980, we were an, an uh, agency of the Presbyterian Church, not an institution. And we were funded through denominational funds that came directly to us. We didn't go out and, and raise money in the same ways that, that they do now. Couldn't depend a whole lot on tuition because a whole lot of folks who were coming to Christ, for training in Christian education were not necessarily coming from well-to-do churches and or families. They were just people who felt a sense of call. So that was a complication. PSCE was forbidden by the rules of the assembly for creating an endowment because our money came from the assembly. So we were on, the only one of the theological institutions that came into the new world with reunion without any endowment funds. The divide across the brook between church educators and pastors was often problematic. Church educators believed that modern churches needed professional degree-holding teachers and youth group leaders, while pastors and perhaps the church at large did not always appreciate the expertise that professional Christian educators provided. 
in 1997, both groups came to realize their worlds would come together, whether they were ready or not. The conversation about relationships with Union Seminary had been going on for decades. There had been many people who had thought the school should merge, the school should become one. But there were, was a whole lot stronger feeling that the uniqueness of what they offered might be lost if they did, and therefore people didn't want to have that happen. And that, that was on both sides, right? On both sides of the street, absolutely. Suddenly it was kind of like, we're taking away our identity. We're the only school out of the 11 that had a specific responsibility and orientation to prepare people for Christian education, regardless of how you lived it out. But that identity was being um, sort of set aside and a feeling of being swallowed up and underappreciated or not appreciated. And so it became problematic and people who had the emotional ties um, who weren't inside look what they're doing to my song ma <laughs> was kind of the, look what they've done and and a lot of change was going on too and the words that were used were federation not merger we didn't put the one school into the other school we simply said we're going to be a federated institution maintaining the integrity of and the identity of each and learn how to live together And then it happened. The Presbyterian School of Christian Education, formerly the Assembly's Training School, ceased to exist as an institution. Union Theological Seminary also ceased to exist. There was now one, Union PSCE. Behind the celebration of a newly formed union, there were many wounds to heal. Anger, animosity, and a great sense of loss were prevalent. There was so much suspicion and so much uh, heartbreak and anger on the part of uh, PSCE and so much um, resentment on the part of union folks because they figured that whatever uh, financial support union needed to do some things they wanted to do had been siphoned off. If it hadn't been federated, what would have happened to PSCE? It would have died. It had about, at best, three years left uh, financially, and it would have gone under. To many, even the new name, Union PSCE, evoked a sense of division rather than unity. It was clear there needed to be a process of healing. Uh, in the federated institution, we will be better stewards of the church's money. Uh, we will be able to engage more effectively in theological education. We intend to protect the identities and enhance the mission of both schools, uh, while at the same time, with the synergy of the new institution, begin to do new things that neither school on its own was able to do. Part of that process came with the realization by all parties that unlike a century ago, Christian education and theological practice must complement each other in church communities. If we can get our hands on those pastors being trained <laughs> so that they can train their lay people in those churches of 150 and 200 and 250, to become the leaders of small groups, to become the teachers, to become those who guide parents in their responsibilities, that we are moving in the right direction. Even if we talk about pastors or those who want to be pastors preaching, that's a form of Christian education because you are explicating the faith to those who are in the pulpit. But I think the opportunity comes when seminary and Christian education are together. It makes a pastor, and it makes the whole congregation more well-rounded and suited to learn about the faith. So I think it has to be hand in hand. It can't be one without the other. They cannot be separated. A pastor needs to be able to teach as well as preach. And one of the things that I have realized that we learned 
in doing Christian education, lesson planning and planning for committees. And that is something that a minister has to do. Has to, you have to plan for a session meeting or various committees. And I think that's one of the benefits of my education uh, and of what we've done in education is helping people learn how to plan. Our students can go out of here able to use a variety of communication media in their ministries. Well, we're not happy that this day, how do you use these media in the theological classroom at your seminary? Uh-uh. How do we use them so our students go out able to use them in their churches? Not just can we do a good presentation in our classroom. That's what Federation offers us when we put it together. We can have students who know how to do ministry in a media culture. In some people's minds, there's a dichotomy between faith and being educated. And why would you, oh, I mean, oh you need to be faithful. You don't need this thing called education. So there's some suspicion, which is kind of weird in the reform tradition where the life of the mind is so much a part of the life of faith. If one solely focused on theology and biblical studies, then one could be a wonderful scholar and write great books and probably give outstanding lectures. But that's not education. And to be able to enable folk to find their own sense of call and to build upon it um, requires some skills that include working together, working uh, in, with groups to help one identify goals and to be able to move forward with those. And they aren't necessarily what one is going to learn in a Bible or theology class. Did we get the vanilla in there? Yeah. Yep, the butter's vanilla. coming. The butter's yeah. coming. He tells Jonah to go tell them if they don't clean up their act, he's, God's going to uh, destroy the city and everyone in it. As the years since Federation have passed, there are no doubt many from the PSCE side of the brook who lament the loss of intense focus on the kind of Christian education taught on the west side of the road. And yet I remember one of the courses that I took at PSEE way back was called Change Agents, that we were being trained to be change agents, that we would go out in a culture with the gospel message, which is counterculture, and be facing change. But you don't beat people up with change. You go in there and build relationships and work together to bring about change. Today, students entering Union Presbyterian Seminary will often study for combined degrees, masters in both divinity and the art of Christian education. Some will focus on one or the other. Ten years after Federation, Brian Blunt took on the job as president of the Combined Seminary and School of Christian Education. He understood how the two institutions, now combined, could have a transformative role in the community. When I first came to uh, the, the seminary as president, people in the community, the African American community, who talked to me about the, the image of the school and the role it played in the life of Richmond at a time when um, integration was taking place, that uh, how grateful they were for the work that was being done at PSCE, not just um, the work in the church, the work in teaching, but the work in healing a community. So ATS and PSCE have a powerful legacy. It's not just about education, it's about people, about changing people. And of course, that's what education is about, changing people in the early phases in the life of the church. But it's also about changing communities. And uh, ATS and PSCE have that legacy, and that's something to be proud of and something to want to continue into the life of the seminary as it goes into the future. I did fear that PSCE might lose its identity. And in fact, I think for a while it did when the Federation came about. I think there were some very tough things, decisions that were made, and not all of them upheld the traditions and the important role that PSCE had played. But I don't believe that anymore. And I think that um, Brian Blunt in particular uh, as well as other people on the board and folk who have an understanding of where that school can be are, are integrating those priorities back into what this seminary is and that PSE is thriving. 
This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. It might have been impossible for young Annie Wilson to imagine a seminary that offered Christian education and divinity with the same degree. She might have even been more surprised to know both men and women could achieve these dual degrees. 100 years later, those revolutionary concepts are simply a natural progression of the faith, of education, and of the future of the Presbyterian Church. Everything that you do um, in ministry, worship leadership to Sunday school classes to you know fellowship hour and the budget meeting every year, all of these things are educational and they're opportunities for teaching and learning and growing in faith. A huge amount of our leadership will take place in small churches, places where you won't be able to hire a pastor and an educator. Many churches have difficulty hiring one person, so to hire two will be impossible for them. So what we endeavor to do here at the seminary is through the curriculum, make sure that our students have the ability to be pastors and educators, and that's what this wonderful dual degree is all about. We cannot hope to maintain a future vitality in the life of the church if we don't figure out how we are going to nurture the faith in the generations that are coming behind us. And Christian education is key to that. <laughs>